Well, I wanted to, uh, can you hear me okay in the back? Um, I wanted to thank all of you. I'll, I'll say that, you know, on my way over today, I've got a, actually a daughter who's 13 and another who's 18, and they both had said sort of earlier in the week, Dad, we'd really like to go hear your talk today. But when they saw how beautiful the weather was outside, <laughs> but one I dropped off at the farmer's market, and she said she wanted to go hang out with friends, and the other was hanging out with friends at home. So um, I wanted to thank all of you for being here on such a, <laughs> a bright and, and sunny and beautiful day. So, um, I'm going to talk today about uh, brain health and mental health. And this is going to speak to, I think, at the very end, to some of the research I'm doing. And I'm doing research right now that really focuses on how we can improve depression care for older adults in primary care settings. And you'll see how that ties in at the very end. Um, today I'm going to be actually talking about mental health in a broader sense. that includes both things like um, depression, uh, but also things like cognitive functioning. So the connections between brain health and cognitive functioning. And I hope to sort of embed in this talk some very practical uh, sorts of advice uh, for all of you, including myself, about how we can cognitively age in the most healthy way. I wanted to also, before I sort of go further, to thank uh, Charlie DeCarly, who, Dr. DeCarly, who was mentioned earlier, uh, who's the director of UC Davis Alzheimer's Disease Center, and he let me borrow a few of the first slides that I'm going to be presenting, so I just wanted to uh, thank him and pu publicly acknowledge his uh, help. So what do we know? In terms of our own sort of aging population here in the U.S., um, this actually shows, uh, back in 1955, the age distribution uh, of our population. And what you can see is a, a very large uh, distribution of, of people who are much younger. Uh, and what we see sort of over time, 1985, and now all the way to uh, projecting to 2035. So what we see is really a huge shift uh, in our population, probably not news to, to any of you. Uh, and many people are living to a much older age. And so older adults in our population are going to be uh, representing, continuing to represent a much larger propor proportion of the population. Um, along with that, and something that's actually really um, something I've been very interested in, is our, our older adult population is also growing more ethnically, linguistically, and culturally diverse. And I think there are a lot of really positive things about this, about this change. I think that older adults have a tremendous amount to contribute, and do, they do contribute to our society. And as I look forward to retirement, I, I think about ways I can con continue to contribute, both in my family and societally. And so, you know, our older adult population is really a tremendous resource uh, for our society. Um, however, there are also some very real <laughs> challenges that come with aging. And one of them is an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And how many people here are familiar with the difference between the term dementia, mild cognitive impairment, and, and something like Alzheimer's disease? Is that pretty, pretty clear to most? No. Well, well, maybe I'll, I'll just go over it very, very quickly. So dementia so, is basically a, a syndrome. Um, that is more common as people grow older, uh, in which uh, because of a, a decline in cognitive abilities, the person is no longer able to take care of themselves and their, their selves independently. So there's a loss of functioning as, as a result of cognitive decline. There are a number of different causes of dementia. So one of the most common is Alzheimer's disease. Vascular disease is another big cause. Lewy bodies in the brain is another cause, and there are others as well that are less common. And often, these things co-occur in the brain to uh, undermine cognitive functioning. So that's what we mean by dementia. I almost think about that you know, the a syndrome that can be caused by multiple different things. Mild cognitive impairment is a clinical syndrome in which there's a decline in cognitive functioning, but it's not to the extent that it really is undermining functioning. So people can be functioning independently, and yet there's been a decline uh, in their cognitive abilities. So that's the difference between the two terms. And what we see is, and again, probably not news to, to most of you, is that um, there's a great risk, an increased risk of developing dementia, especially as we age. 
aging is actually the strongest uh, risk factor for the development of dementia. And so what we see up in, in people who are 85 years of age and above, a third to maybe a half of people will actually be suffering from a dementia syndrome. Um, you know, I mentioned that our, our population is becoming more linguistically and culturally diverse. Uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease is, is, is blind to race and culture and ethnicity. It affects all our cultures and ethnicity. So it's, it's present and increasing across all the different populations. So uh, we have this increase in rates of dementia. So what's happening to the brain uh, as we age? And so one thing that we find is that there's brain shrinkage as a result of the shrinkage of both gray and white matter in the brain. That is, neurons are lost, uh, there, there is an atrophy in the brain, and there's also sort of vascular injury in the brain. And so we see over time, if you look at a population of people of that slide over on your left, that over time, if you look, and all those dots are different individuals, that over time, uh, what you see on a sort of population basis, basis is a shrinkage in terms of the volume uh, of the brain. And you see those things right in the middle of the brain, those are the ventricles. Those are basically sort of fluid or open space in the brain. And so that represents a shrinkage of the brain matter and an increase uh, in the size of the ventricles. Um, however, one thing if you look over at that, um, at that graph on sort of brain shrinkage, what you also see, if you look at those dots, there's a tremendous amount of variability, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can talk about brain shrinkage, but Actually, for some people, the brain may shrink in, in size and the volume, but for others, uh, it may not. So there's a lot of variability from individual to individual. The same thing with vascular injury. So that's the other thing that we see in the brain, is an increase in vascular disease. I, I think about it as, you know, how the heart develops. You develop heart disease, the arteries kind of narrow, and, and, and sometimes you get have a heart attack. Well, in the brain, you have vascular disease, sometimes small strokes, sometimes big strokes. Mm -hmm. And what you see on a population basis is an increase in the vascular disease in the brain. And all this kind of white stuff up here, that's all vascular disease. Now, that being said, you look at those dots, there's a lot of variability, right? Some people develop that, some people don't. I think the other thing that's really interesting and is sort of at the cutting edge of the field of Alzheimer's disease research is that um, while brain shrinkage and vascular injury correlate with cognitive health and cognitive decline, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. In other words, you can have one person who has a huge amount of sort of vascular disease in their brain, and clinically, when you examine them, they actually are cognitively normal and functioning well. So there's a lot we don't know, too, about how vascular injury and brain shrinkage, how those lead to the development of dementia. So there are a lot of individual differences. And so up, up at the top, um, actually what you see is a, um, basically a, a graph that shows uh, cognition, change in cognition over time. And again, the big, the big uh, sort of uh, picture there is that there's a lot of difference. If you look at sort of cognitive functioning, there's a lot of individual difference. This graph down at the bottom shows the hippocampus, which, which was mentioned earlier. So it's a, a part of the brain that's supposed to be very important for short-term short memory, for making short-term memories and, and creating longer-term memories. There's also a tendency over time for people to, for the hippocampus to atrophy, but there's a huge amount of variability from person to person. And so these are actually brains of actual subjects followed over time. And so what you see in these, these two people is that they started uh, at a very different place uh, in terms of the amount of atrophy in the brain, but over time there wasn't any significant change. So again, sort of emphasizing the importance of individual differences. So if we think about cognition, and I mentioned sort of cognition, and, and there are different ways, these are all these fancy ways of kind of measuring a cognitive ability. Uh, so you have a digit symbol, et cetera, different pattern uh, comparison, you have uh, short-term memory, vocabulary, and what you see is that there are some significant declines with aging, especially in speed of processing, working memory, and long-term memory. So you see that sort of if you take a group of individuals or population, you see a decline with increasing age. However, there are other things that actually stay the same or maybe even get a little bit better, and that has to do with vocabulary, sort of language. So there's some things that actually decline over time. Um, but there are other things that actually improve. Now that being said, 
this is a graph that shows, again, cognitive functioning over time in a group of individuals. And what you see is a pattern of decline in different groups of individuals, but a huge amount of variability from individual to individual. So this is a, a lot of the research is really focused right now on trying to understand this variability uh, from individual to individual. Why do some people decline cognitively while others don't? And so that leads to kind of the second part of my talk today, which is really going to focus on um, looking at risk, what do we know about risk factors and protective factors for cognitive health and cognitive decline? And so I think what you don't want me to do is, is, to, is to kind of deliver the message that this doctor is delivering to their patient here. You can read at the bottom. So you're 57 years old. That's about my age. I said, I'd like you to get that down a bit. <laughs> we know already from, from the talk that you know, age is the big, biggest risk factor for cognitive decline and development of dementia, et cetera. But that's not something you can really sort of affect, right? That's uh, not a risk factor that you change. However, there was the Institute of Medicine about two years ago actually uh, developed a committee to come up with recommendations for cognitive aging and cognitive health. Um, this is actually, I think it's now posted on the website, so you don't need to take copious notes. This report is actually, it, it can be accessed free over the internet from the Institute of Medicine. Really a useful guide, I think, to these risk, risk and protective factors. So they, they basically, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Institute of Medicine, but they bring together experts from around the country. Uh, they, sit, they sort of uh, deliberate on all the evidence and come up with recommendations uh, for cognitive health or aging. And so these are actually, if you go through this report, these are all the different things that they looked at in terms of uh, different risk factors and uh, potential protective factors. And so what did they find? What was it? So, what, so really the goal here was to come up with recommendations for cognitive health. And this, this basically distills their recommendations for cognitive health. So I'm going to use the pointer here, but let's see if we can kind of go through this together and see what their recommendations were. Let's see if I can. So how about this one up in, the far, in the, that upper, uh, your left-hand corner? What would that speak to? Social engagement. So there's a fair amount of evidence, most of it actually observational, that social engagement uh, is a healthy thing for people. How about this one right here? Exercise. Exercise. Actually, some of the strongest evidence for preventing cognitive decline and even dementia comes from the physical activity exercise area. So this does not mean, as I tell my patients, my older adults at the VA who are concerned about their cognitive health, it doesn't mean that you get out tomorrow and run a marathon. <laughs> this is kind of moderate exercise and within the bounds of what's sort of healthy or good for you. But there's really a lot of powerful evidence. Actually, phys for physical exercise, not only for its positive impact on uh, cognitive health, but also things like anxiety and depression. It's really a pretty remarkable, um, remarkable thing. How about this one up here? Heart healthy. So things that are basically good for the brain, uh, are good for the heart are actually good for the brain. So cardiovac so controlling and managing cardiovascular risk, risk factors, things like diabetes, uh, hypertension, smoking, uh, et cetera, are, this is the other thing that was sort of recommended in the report. How about this? This is a tough one down here. <laughs> be, see, a young, yeah, be young if you can, but at least try to get a lot of sleep. Or the other thing that's often overlooked, and I see this again and again in my own clinical practice, is that people will have sleep disorders that are not diagnosed. Sleep apnea, really common. And so sleep disorders like, like sleep apnea, not getting enough sleep, that, that, that good sleep hygiene and getting a good night's sleep is something that's been shown in, in research to be associated with better cognitive health. And how about this one right here? Creativity. Creativity. Learning. Learning, so lifelong learning. Lifelong learning, so staying engaged intellectually uh, in your world is also something, there's a fair amount of evidence for that as well. Uh, and finally, how about over, over here? Here we care. Regular medical checkups. Yeah. So basically it's discussing with your doctor sort of the health conditions that you have and making sure that, um, that there aren't health or medical conditions that are not being addressed that could negatively impact uh, your cognitive health. Um, and so that discussion would include a discussion of medications. 
So there are two types of medications that have been pretty strongly associated with cognitive decline or cognitive impairment. Anybody guess what those are? So basically drugs that have anticholinergic properties. And so there's actually one thing that you take away from this today, if you're on very many medications at all or you have friends who are, is to take a look at the medications, especially if you're having problems with memory, and making sure that you don't, you're not on a number of medications that have anticholinergic properties. In this report, they give a list of those. There's also a wonderful thing on the internet called the Anticholinergic Burden Scale by investigators at the University of Indianapolis. And they have a list of all the different medications and their anticholinergic properties. When people, anticholinergic. Uh, so it, it's CH, CH, here we go, Dr. McAllister. You can't read that. Okay. And so basically it would be, you know, a drug, a common drug that has uh, anticholinergic properties would be Benadryl. So Benadryl is something people commonly take. It has anticholinergic properties, and it's associated with cognitive impairment. Now it's not that you can't, it's possible to take a small dose of that, uh, you know, and, and do fine. But if you're on a, drugs that have a lot of anticholinergic properties over time, uh, it's associated with uh, cognitive impairment. Now, I, once I gave a lecture to a large group in Sacramento, this is about five or six years ago, literally must have been 500 people in the room. I was together with a couple of behavioral neurologists, and there was actually a gentleman who stood up and told his story of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or dementia and having seen several physicians. And what they found out is that three or four years later, he actually didn't have dementia. And what they missed is he was on several different medications that had anticholinergic properties. And those created a load or stress on the brain that actually made him have a dementia syndrome. So a really important thing to do is to take a, take a look and, and try to reduce things like that, that you use for bladder control. So some of those have anticholinergic properties as well. So, um, <clears throat> so at any rate, uh, the other thing is benzodiazepines. So things like you know Valium or Ativan, et cetera. Those are associated with in increased risk of falls and also cognitive decline. So these are, this, and this is all up on the web, so you don't have to write this down. But this is sort of what I've just gone through, sort of all of the different um, recommendations for cognitive health. And I'm not going to sort of go through them again, but uh, feel free to access the materials on the net, you know, um, and print this up for yourself. Share it with your friends. So what about depression? So I didn't have anything on depression up there, right? I think there's actually some pretty good evidence that's, uh, that's emerging that clinical depression is associated with an increased risk of cognitive decline and even dementia. And so when I, when, I'm talk, when I talk about clinical depression, I'm not talking about just feeling down or blue for a few hours or a day or even a couple of days. It's a pervasive disturbance of mood in which people are feeling down. They lose interest in things that they used to be interested in. Uh, they feel irritable and a bit angry all the time. They get sort of socially isolated. So it's a, a clinical syndrome, very treatable. And one of the tragic things is that even though we have really good treatments for depression, many of them non-pharmacologic, we still are having trouble giving people access to those treatments, especially in primary care where most people with uh, depression are actually treated. Some of my own work, again, is sort of focused on older adults and how we can do a better job of that in primary care. So what do, you, what do we know about depression and uh, cognitive decline? There's a fair amount of evidence, actually a lot of evidence from epidemiolog observational epidemiologic studies that if you take people who are co cognitively normal at one point in time and you, you look at their level of depression, people who have higher levels of depression are more likely to decline cognitively or even develop dementia. So there's a large body of evidence. It's true both in midlife, the association is probably a little bit stronger, but also later in life. So there, that people who develop uh, depression later in life are more likely to go on to develop cognitive, incline, cognitive decline. Now, and if you have a question about the mechanism, I, I, there's some interesting sort of ways to think about how, about how that connection uh, might actually occur, the mechanism. Um, but the thing that we don't have is we don't have intervention studies yet. So actually, if you thought that this was a true kind of connection, what you could do is aggressively inter intervene in a group of, of people who have depression, 
uh, really make sure that they sort of you know intervene to um, treat their depression and then see if actually their cognitive health is better than another group that perhaps doesn't have as good a quality of depression care. We don't have that sort of interventional sort of data yet. Uh, but I think this is a really, really important area and, and obviously one that's very close to my own heart. So I am going to stop there and I want to thank you for being so patient as I went through those slides and I don't know if I have a couple of minutes for questions. It looks like I do. Uh,